So guess what? I've been waiting for the longest time to get some criticism on the work I've done on high throughput screening. So finally, I have two people that took it upon themselves to criticize me. Wow, I love a good criticism. So let's go through what they had to say about the drug discovery process and where I should and can improve. Hi, today we're going to be talking about the process of discovering drugs for the treatment of disease. In order to do that, we're going to look at three main components of the process, which is identifying a target, uh, target identification, then high throughput screening to identify a small molecule that can be progressed on to make a drug, and then... So the previous account of the drug discovery process was a very abridged version. The full version that I should present is that after starting with target identification, you want to go... You, your next step is hit identification. So in your screen, based on the signal, you are going to identify compounds that are potentially interacting with your target. So those compounds, when you, com you validate those compounds that show a higher signal or a lower signal, depending on the experimental setup, you confirm them with a counter screen. You check for the dose response, the potency of the compound. And if they pass those stages, then they can be classed as hits. The hit progresses to becoming a lead only when it's confirmed via another technology so what is called an orthogonal assay that's the only time it becomes a lead and it, they also the the particular hit has to have evidence that a structure activity relationship can be built around it that it's amenable to being changed to be drug-like so if it doesn't have these properties then you know a hit will not become a lead so this is the step now you're going to be working with the chemist to improve the drug likeness properties of that of that lead and then you're going to go on preclinical testing this is where you are doing the experiments now inside whole living systems so usually animal models you go on to clinical trials this is you where you do it in humans if all parameters or safety checks are passed then you go on to approval and launch also, how do chemists even know where to start? Like, how do they know what structures or compounds? Well, the best way to, to do something is to just copy an existing one, right? Yes, that's right, but there are other ways as well. So in terms of starting points for small molecules that you can use in your drug screen, I mentioned in the previous video you can start off with compounds that nature has already synthesized that we know of, such as penicillin or and, and kind of use the structures. But there are an impressive amount of literature on what makes a good compound. There's the Lipinski's rule of five, which describes what would make a good compound. There are enormous amount of literature that chemists can refer to to synthesize compounds that cover as much chemical space as possible. So you start off then in this process with target, what's called a target identification. This is where you identify a target in the disease phenotype. Phenotype just means what it looks like. To do this, you check hundreds of thousands of what are, what are called small molecule or compounds, small molecule compounds, for their ability to alter what the disease looks like. So with the target identification where you're looking at changing how the disease looks, that's a, tip, a phenotypic screen. It's described as a phenotypic screen. However, there are also other ways of intervening in the disease. In the phenotypic screen, you know that the small molecule affects the outcome of the disease. It interacts and affects the outcome. But you actually don't know what it's doing, which target it's engaging with. The modern approach, which is the targeted approach, involves targeting a specific component of the cell. It's usually proteins because proteins are the mediators of cellular activities. So you can have receptors being targeted, such as G protein coupled receptors which are common targets for drugs or you can have an enzyme being targeted for example kinases and proteases could be targeted and other targets uh, include ion channels and transporters in the cell then you need an assay 
An assay simply means an experimental setup that allows you to check if any of the compounds can interact with your target. You need to miniaturize the experiments. You need to go from the standard experiment volume, such as an experiment that you would have done in an Eppendorf tube or in a test tube or you larger format. You need to miniaturize it to the smallest volume that still allows us to detect differences. That still allows us to have a solid experiment, what is called a robust experiment. So those 384 well and 1536 plates that I mentioned, they are micro teeter plates, polystyrene plates that allow you to conduct the experiment. 36 well plates allow you to have volumes up to 350 microliters and 384 well plates will allow you to have volumes up to 100 microliters while the 1536 well plates will allow you to have up to 12 microliters of reagents in total. So now let's go to the heart of the matter. Well, at least what's readily associated with the process. So that comes to the high triple side. So the high triple side, the first thing you do is to what's called an assay transfer. You transfer the assay into a highly reduced volume, as I already alluded to, so that keeping all the components the same, you're not changing any components. You're starting with what works and you're just reducing the volume. So in the assay transfer, assay development part, you test for the suitability of the assay components. So you look at things like the volume of the assay, how tolerant the assay is of DMSO. This is important because commercial compounds, compounds that you will, or small molecules that you will purchase commercially to check are usually dissolved in DMSO. So you check what percentage tolerance it works for the assay that you intend to run the experiment that you tend to run you would also titrate all the components that you want to use in the assay so if the proteins and enzymes or peptides that you're checking the interaction you want to check that you have the right ratios you have the right concentrations for testing in the experiment so what you aim for is that you have a good signal at the low volume for detecting the target and how it is altered we need to use a few parameters to check that it's suitable to go into this high throughput, which means miniaturized format. So that one of the first things, one of the parameters you can check, you can check the signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio compares your ability to detect a signal to when there is no signal. So just the no noise and it actually factors in the standard deviation. So you've done the pilot with that concentration. Then we come to what is called the primary screen. This is the screen. This is only done when you know everything's going well and you're at a good place. So the screen, you select one concentration again, 10 micromolar usually, could be more, could be less. And depending on what you understand about your system and then you only do one, one well. But you don't just assume it's working well, you have some uh, parameters that you can check so you can put positive controls on the plate, you can put negative control, you're not you can, you will, put positive controls, put negative controls, and you can use that to calculate your Z prime and your Z factor. So I mentioned positive and negative controls. So you're to describe our positive and negative controls, let's first describe what a signal is. So your signal. Your signal is the reporter. Whatever you're using, your detection system to let you know that an interaction is happening or not happening. That is your signal. So your signal could be fluorescent, it could be luminescent, it could be chemiluminescent. So that's your signal. So your signal defines when your target is inhibited, it's stopped from doing what it, it needs to do, or when it's activated, as in it's encouraged to do what it wants to do. Depending on, on your experimental context, what you're trying to achieve, your signal could mean that there's a, something happening in terms of stopping it or increasing it. Just depends on how you've designed the experiment. So positive controls. Positive controls can be, depending on your experimental context, what you are trying to answer. There could be either a small molecule or drug that inhibits or activates in your experiment. It's been validated, it's been checked. You know that it does what 
you in, you need your experiment to demonstrate. So it's your reference to to just see these any of these new com- compounds behaving in a way that I want. What you want, it's your positive control. <laughs> And there's your negative control. Your co- negative control is in, in the experimental context. It could be where you have a protein missing or a peptide missing or an enzyme missing, or it could just be where you have no compound. So it's just a DMSO in the system. And that's your negative control. And that reports to you when there is nothing happening. And you need that to check that your new compound. If you think nothing is happening, you kind of compare it to your negative control. Yep, it's the same. Okay, that means nothing is happening. And you need a negative control because you this is a compound or a situation where you know for sure nothing is happening. Whereas in your test compounds, you don't know for sure. So you just need something to reference it to. Then there is your percent effect. Your percent effect is a compound that you put on the plate to define when you have an effect. The percent effect is calculated by comparing the signal that you get from your control compounds with the signal that you get from the unknown compounds, the compounds that you're trying to determine if they have any activity in your experiments. So an important statistical parameter in all of these is your Z factor calculation. Your Z factor calculation contrasts with your Z prime calculation. Of course, it had to be difficult. It had to sound the same so that you can get confused. So for your Z factor calculation, you take the average of all the compound results. Then three standard deviations above the average is the point at which a compound is likely a compound result is likely due to be a genuine result and not just noise. So I'll say it again. Your Z factor calculation tells you how you calculate it. You take the average of all the compound results. Then the three standard deviations above that is the point at which a compound is likely, a compound result is likely due to be a genuine result and not just noise. So to calculate it, you need your reference control. So each plate, you will have a 100% effect control and a 0% effect control. You're going to combine the results of all the compounds which you have expressed as percentage of the 100% effect control and 0% controls so that you can compare them. So now that you've done that, you actually have to check that they are normally distributed because the calculation only applies if your data is normally distributed. So you're going to plot a histogram to see if it's normally distributed. And if it is normally distributed, then you use three standard deviations over or above the mean, which is also known as the average, to select a statistically significant hit hit being inverted commas because you have to actually validate it. But at this point, you know, you, you get a signal that is three standard deviations above the, the average, then you think, okay, this is above the noise, this is a genuine interaction. So an example is if I have an assay in which I've determined the percent effect of my compound to be 10%. Just from looking at the reference compound, I know that the percent effect of this particular unknown compound is 10%. And I have a standard deviation, unfortunately, of quite a large, you know, the limit kind of uh, deviation, 20%. So if I have 20%, then three standard deviations would be 60, right? 60%. Remember, we we want it to be above the percent effect, and the percent effect is 10%. So I would be looking for compounds with a 70 70% effect in that system because of the percent effect being 10 and three standard devi- and my standard deviation being 20. If I do three standard deviations of that, then it's 60. So I'm above that. What if my standard deviation was uh, 10%? Well, then I just have three standard deviations is 30. And and if the percent effect is 10, then we are looking for 40 percent. So the compound needs to have the compounds that show 40 percent effect would be considered a hit. So to reinforce the idea, three standard deviations above the average percent effect is what's going to be considered as a statistically significant hit, which you would then go on to validate. So your Z 
wet prime calculations can actually be done way before your palette and in fact before you go into your palette that's in you know in the essay transfer that's where you do your z prime z prime factor calculations and this will give you an idea of how well your essay is you can do it even with just empty plates because really it's just your positive controls your neg negative controls so if you just put them on a plate run run the essay and then you use your technology to detect the reporter and the reporter tells you that you have a particular you know 20,000 signal for instance for your negative control and then you've got 50,000 for your positive you know you've got, you've got signal to background ratio of about two then you can look at the variability within that and if that variability is good then you decide to go ahead with the essay or you know maybe you get a signal to background of um, 10 that's really good and then you can go ahead and look at the variability in that so your z prime factor just allows you to see how good your essay is and as we will cover specifically in a z prime video it is not just using high throughput screen it can be used to assess any essay in any setting because you really just want to see how good the essay is thank you all so so much for taking the time to watch this video if you have any comments you know what to do and if you enjoyed this kind of content please subscribe